Baggett, I guess I haven't been to Dallas since uh, the Cotton Bowl. But... What? You all thought I was going to get up here and not talk about the Cotton Bowl and Johnny football? And it was, this is a, you know, I, I can't help it. This was a great year. This was great fun. And Baggett takes full credit for all of it. So uh, Mike was head yell leader back in 1968, I think, in 67, 68. So uh, anyway, and, and we were just uh, having some uh, reminiscing about uh, what, a, what a fun year that was. And, um, and uh, congratulations on your, your new uh, uh, role as the, as the chairwoman for this chamber. And, and uh, uh, on a serious note, I, I, I do hope all of you keep Jim Oberwetter in your prayers. Uh, he, is a, he is a great man, a good friend, and uh, does a, a fabulous job. And I know he's had a little bump in his road health-wise and, and uh, would be here today uh, were it not for taking care of that. So just keep Anita and, and, and Jim in your prayers as, as you go forward. And, um, I uh, look forward to continuing the good work that we've done between the chamber and in the years. And I know uh, you said, you know, hearing former chairman is a wonderful title uh, of, of the chamber. But, you know, I, I, I know these folks rather well and, and, and that when they flip their switch uh, in the morning every day to go to work, whether it's in the private sector or whether it is to uh, give of their pro bono time to uh, a group like the, the chamber, Ronnie, that this is, uh, this is why this community is as successful as it is. And, and uh, you know, this morning uh, when we got up and talking about uh, successful stories, and uh, I, w I was handed very early in, in the morning uh, the announcement that Amazon was going to uh, uh, expand their uh, fulfillment center operations here in the state of Texas and Capel and Haslett are both two sites that are going to be uh, uh, recipients of those one million square foot plus facilities and they're going to put over a thousand people to work in, uh, in, in the state of Texas and, and one of their commitments is to uh, really going and recruiting veterans in, in, the, in the area. So what a, what a powerful message. And uh, Shirts down just north of San Antonio is the other location for one of those centers as well. So uh, anyway, that was just a, a great way to start the morning. And uh, I, I do appreciate you all to be here to uh, hear the state of the state version 2.0. Um, and um, uh, the fact is, it is always my, my pleasure to go and to talk about this state, whether it's in Texas or it's outside the boundaries of this state, and to, uh, to, to report that the state of our state is stronger than ever. Uh, our, our bank balance is healthy, our uh, economy is growing, our, our future is limitless. Uh, we led the nation out of recession into the recovery. Uh, the, we do today remain the, the nation's prime destination for employers and job seekers alike. You know, Texas employers have added more than a half a million jobs over the course of the last two years, a total of nearly 1.4 million jobs over the last 10 years. Uh, and and those, those numbers are, are testimony to uh, the hard work that's done by men and women that I'm looking into the eyes of in here. Those of you who go out there every day and, uh, and, and analyze what's going on. You make the decision about whether or not you're going to risk your capital on particular projects. It's about community leaders, uh, Clay, like yourself, who uh, understand the importance of economic developments, like the Chamber and, and having these organizations coming together, working with the local leaders and with the business community. Uh, but this kind of success starts with a job-friendly economic climate that we find in this state. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's that climate that steadily draws attention all across the country, rich, around the globe now. I mean, people around the world know about Texas, whether uh, we're in China or we're in India or we're in uh, one of the other uh, fast, growing uh, economies around the world. They know what's going on in Texas. Texas is on the radar screen of, of all those folks. Uh, and, and we've created that climate where 
any employer can have the opportunity to thrive and be competitive in a global economy. That's just helped establish, establish Texas as the number one exporting state in the nation for the last 10 years. Um, and it didn't happen by chance. More than a decade ago, we set out, and you did a good job of just reminding people that uh, we, we set out to create uh, a Texas where investors could confidently uh, invest their capital, expect to see that solid return on their investment, and uh, thanks to a low tax environment, a regulatory climate that's fair and predictable, legal system that doesn't allow for oversuing, that's exactly what we've been able to do. Uh, we created this uh, uh, in environment uh, purposely. Uh, you know, from time to time, we get we get uh, criticized about uh, uh, the, the the reducing uh, spending when the revenues go down, rather than like some of the other uh, states have done, and 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 maybe our friends in Washington D.C. have have followed that uh, path uh, uh, as well from the standpoint of of, of not controlling spending. And, and Texans have responded in a very powerful way. Uh, we, we've dedicated ourselves to cultivating a workforce uh, that stands ready to fill any need uh, that an employer may have out there, uh, whether it's on the assembly line or whether it's in a sales office or whether it's in a laboratory. Uh, our dedication to those principles helped to build an economy strong enough to withstand the strains of a national recession. Uh, and today has us in particularly strong position to continue our upward economic trajectory. As I made mention, last session we had to make some very difficult uh, decisions about our economy. We talked about this a little earlier when we were just in a private meeting. Uh, and we held the line on our taxes. We uh, spent within our means and we made the tough decisions separating our wants from our needs. The revenue estimate that we got earlier this month, I think, is a testimony that we made the right decisions. Uh, when you look at 2000, there, there are two very important periods of time, I think, in the last decade. In 2003, we were faced with a $10 billion budget shortfall. And we made that decision to reduce the spending, uh, to, to not raise taxes on the job creators out there. Uh, we also passed the most sweeping tort reform in the nation. And when we came back into legislative session in 2005, we had an $8 billion uh, revenue estimate over and above what we had spent the previous two year period of time. We sent the message to the job creators that here is the consistency that you are going to find to these principles, core principles that we're not gonna raise taxes just to fill spending needs because that may have been the way it had historically uh, been done. And then in 2011, when we came back in, we were, in, we were following Clay at the end of a national recession where there was an extraordinary turndown all across the country, jobs lost, revenues drying up. And we heard the same criticisms of you can't cut that much out of the state budget. If you do, it'll do irreparable harm. People will not move here. It's gonna hurt the reputation of the state. But we knew that in 03, that when we did that, the response from those of you in the business community was gonna be powerful. And that's exactly what the result of honing to those principles, being true to those values that we know work and that blueprint that's worked. And there were hard decisions. There were substantial reductions in spending made. But when Comptroller Combs announced earlier in the month the revenue estimate was $20 billion. $20 billion more than that budget that we had put into place. So the point is now all across this country, but is very importantly in this state, there are men and women who understand that there is stability, predictability in the leaders and the legislature in Austin, Texas. And that is a very, very, predictability and stability is so important to those of you as we watch what goes on around the world and, and, and out of Washington, D.C. Uh, you know, people are very concerned about, you know, what's going to happen next? What, what are they going to do next? I mean, how are they going to deal with the budget? What are they going to do on the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the budget ceiling? I mean, all, of, all the debt ceiling, all of those 
are unpredictability. They're instability. They give people reason to pause. But in Texas, we haven't functioned that way. We're in a position right now to put our financial house in order, if you will, uh, and I think it's time to do so. Uh, and we earned this opportunity, this session, to true up our budget uh, because we have that revenue estimate because of the dollars that we find in our rainy day fund. Uh, we need to move away from some budgetary techniques that we've used in the past. Uh, we need to pay now what is due now. We should put in place a stronger constitutional limit on spending growth, making sure that it never exceeds our population and inflation combined. We need to make the franchise tax exemption for small businesses permanent. We should continue to scrub the budget for any of those inefficiencies or duplications. We also need to do away with the practice of using dedicated funds and specific fees for anything other than what the legislature said they were going to use those for. Now you think about what that uh, means. I, We talked about transportation infrastructure. Fund six is to build roads and bridges and to build transportation infrastructure. Let's stop that diversion of fund six to anything other than to build transportation infrastructure in this state. That will free up some $1.3 billion of which we can build these very important infrastructures in, in Texas. You know, we, we just never bought into that notion that you need to spend everything just because you can collect it, just because the money's there. That, that's been one of the things that, that, that I've been proud of that the legislature has done. That's why I've called for putting a mechanism into place uh, that when we do bring in more than we need, that we'll have the option of returning tax money directly to the people who paid it. And currently, uh, you can't do that, Mike. I mean, it, it's... Um, um, our Constitution forbids that, and I think it's time for us to fix it and allow it so that, uh, you know, either the current or future legislatures can, in fact, uh, have that option. Um, I think it uh, sends rather a, uni a unique message out across the country uh, that there is a place where they're not going to spend all the money, that you can, in fact, get some of it back. Uh, and a legislative session where we can see billions of dollars still on the table after we funded our services and met the needs of our ever-expanding uh, population, I think providing tax relief uh, of at least $1.8 billion over this biennium is a good place to start. As to how we, how we go about that, I think the, uh, the debate's open. Uh, you can uh, go to our main website at uh, gov.texas.gov and there's a whole list of, of taxes and fees that you can click on to, and, and send the message to, to the governor's office, which we'll be more than happy to share with our friends in the legislature, but uh, to, to, to really hear from the people of the state of Texas. How would you, if you were sitting in our, our seats, uh, deal with this issue of, of, uh, of debt, or, or I should say tax relief? And, uh, you know, sometimes Washington can seem to be very unresponsive, but I hope that in Austin uh, we have a different way of looking at it. And, and I, I'm just proud that in Texas, that uh, whether it was on the, uh, the front page of one of the uh, websites that's read by millions of people every day, that uh, in the state of Texas they're talking about giving money back. Uh, what a powerful juxtaposition that is with uh, with what's going on. And as our population expands and industries grow across uh, our state, uh, the demand is uh, increasing upon the fundamental building blocks that we have in our communities. And uh, that's why we really have to focus on our infrastructure, our water, our surface uh, infrastructure in particular, and, 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 our, and our power. And, and, and doing it without breaking the budget is going to require some pretty creative thinking and outside the box thinking, but that's, that's okay. I happen to believe one of the answers to that is to go to the rainy day fund and take some of that rainy day fund money. We're up to $12 billion now. 
And, and you've got to keep in mind, why did we have a rainy day fund uh, to, to begin with? And I think it was in the late 80s when we created this. And it was in, in case of a, a major natural disaster. That Category 5 storm that comes in through the, uh, the, the ship channel in Houston, Texas. That level five or six tornado, God forbid, that could ever hit downtown Dallas, Texas. That type of just catastrophic natural disaster to have the protection, to have a bond rating that was as strong as it can be when the state of Texas does, in fact, borrow money, they can do it at the lowest rate they can. Those are the reasons that the rainy day fund was put into place. And as it's reached this approaching $12 billion, we don't need that much money in the rainy day fund to protect ourselves for those two reasons. So take part of that and use it to create a fund that can underwrite these major transportation and, um, and water projects that are so desperately needed in this state. And, and you think about it, it it's, it's not just about economic development, which is the, I will suggest to you, the most important thing that we do, not just in Austin, but that you do in, in, in the city, and in, in Clay, that you do in the county from the standpoint of, of all, we have a lot of different and important issues that we deal with. But I will suggest that economic development is the single most important one because if you don't first have the climate where people can risk their capital and have the return on the investment that brings in the resources to pay for the needs, then at some point in time that collapses of its own weight. And in Texas we balance that uh, properly. And, and building this transportation infrastructure is not just about economic development, it's about quality of life as well. Being stuck on that uh, 635, uh, trying to get to the, trying to get to the, the your daughter's soccer game or to uh, wherever it is that, that you're going. I mean, it's it's a, it's a quality of life issue, as well. You know, I talked about quality of life in, in the in the state of the state, and I and I talked about how important it was for the cultural arts, and this community was one of them. That I pointed out. You think about in the decade, Bill Sproul's here somewhere, and we knew that one of the reasons that Boeing chose. Chicago over Dallas-Fort Worth back in 2001 for their headquarters was that the decision makers of the spouses didn't feel that the cultural arts were as substantial enough that they would be comfortable with and they chose Chicago over Dallas-Fort Worth. Now I'm not going to argue whether that was right or wrong. What I'm going to tell you is that was the perception. And we fast forward now to 10 years later, what has happened in this Dallas-Fort Worth area? Fort Worth built a new museum of modern art. They built a bass performing symphony hall, one of the finest in the world. The AT&T, the Meyerson here. The Perros just finished this fabulous natural science facility. Nashers relocated their sculpture garden here. American Film Institute calls this home now. It's happened in a decade. I will suggest to you it's happened because decisions that have been made in this state that allow entrepreneurs to keep more of what they've worked for. And they made the right decisions to put that back into, in this case, the cultural arts. has made a quality of life impact. No longer would a company like Boeing say, well, we just, you know, kind of concerned about the, it's what we go sell today. When I go to California over the course of the next two weeks and I try to recruit businesses to come to the state of Texas, I'm going to be talking to them about, you need to come see what's happening in Dallas, Fort Worth on the cultural arts side. That's no longer a, 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 that's no longer a perception. The reality is now that this is a place that is extraordinarily strong with a commitment to the cultural arts as well as to the economic well-being. What a great and a powerful story we have to tell. There's a little Paul Harvey part of this. I, I don't know if I've shared with you all before, but two years ago I ran into Phil Condit. Phil Condit was the head of um, Boeing. And so I shared that little story with him, substantially more compressed than that. We were on the, uh, in the hangar of the USS Reagan. And uh, 
he, he, he shook his head and smiled rather large, and he said, yeah, there is more truth to that story about why we chose Chicago about the cultural arts than you would under, that you would, you would uh, uh, believe. And I said, well, where are you living now, Phil? And he got a bigger smile on his face. He said, Frisco, Texas. <laughs> So obviously, Ms. Condit is very happy with the cultural arts in the Dallas-Fort Worth area now. Uh, but I think that goes to the heart of who we are as a state. You all should be, I mean, thank you all for what you have done. As I look at this chamber, the people who have made the decisions. You know, the, 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 my colleagues in Austin have helped create the climate. But if you, if you don't have the will and the, the drive and the vision to implement your economic dream, then it doesn't happen. And in Texas, when, I, when you think about who we are, where we came from, uh, the idea of, of being able to, uh, you know, this, this pioneering spirit of, of carving out this, uh, this place called Texas on this rugged frontier, I mean, the, a, a century plus ago when, the, when people came to, to build Dallas, Texas, and we've just got this really long, proud, uh, it's a tradition of working together. And whether it's South Texas ranchers or DFW teachers, whether it's Gulf uh, shrimpers working with uh, West Texas farmers, people coming together and working together. We, we are a diverse tapestry uh, of cultures and faiths, of bloodlines, but we're bound by this common spirit. And it's a common lineage that is remarkable for a state that, that's so big. Not only will we all be working together over the next few days as we go through this legislative session, and we're gonna be working together every day in companies and uh, in agencies across our state, you know, from the governor's office to uh, local chambers of commerce to, uh, you know, some small town or small counties government offices. Just all being really privileged to be a part of what is Texas. Texas is not merely strong, it's exceptional. We are a testament to the power of freedom, to the entrepreneurial spirit unleashed from government interference. We believe these ideals are sturdy enough and strong enough to advance any and all Texans, regardless of their race, their color, their creed. We all need to come together, work hard to keep Texas on the right track of this continued economic prosperity. So once again, I thank you all for your attentiveness, for your time, and I just challenge you to be on the top of your game as you go forward. We're gonna need the best and the brightest in the months and the years to come as we continue to make Texas and Dallas an even better place to live, to raise a family, and to call home. God bless you.